This is a little awkward, Dave. It's different. It's not the same setup we uh, normally are used to here. I don't. We don't have like a quarterback. It's, it's just you and I, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I, don't, I feel like Ricky Bobby. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> what are we supposed to do here? We don't have Ian. I'm just gonna stare over in that direction, I guess. At his empty chair, longingly. Do we need to like do like a ten bell salute? <laughs> Pour one out for him. He's not dead. Ian's not dead. <laughs> Uh, so we had some technical difficulties this week with everything going on. We, uh, we tried to do a, uh, quarantine a, show, a quarantine show with Ian via Skype. We ran into some major technical difficulties. And, uh, so we apologize. We sent out the teaser picture on Friday for a reptilian episode, and we're going to have to postpone that one week to next Sunday. So we apologize for that. That was not our intention. We never meant to, uh, you know, mislead anybody or give you false hope. But um, good news know, is, there's another uh, great episode on tap instead. I think we're gonna make up for it tenfold for the uh, people who are not patrons. We're gonna go back into the Patreon archive, back to Thanksgiving Day. Actually, is that when it was released? Is when this episode right. was released. And for you people who are not patrons, we are going to release our Chris Benoit episode. And uh, Narrated before, by you, Mike. Narrated by episode? me. It was my narration debut. It was great. Before everyone turns their nose up at a pro wrestling episode, <laughs> I, I just want to say I, I think you should hear this one out. It is a crazy true crime story. And uh, yeah, it was a little bit different because I had to narrate that one. And I, th- I feel like Ian put his feet up for that, had a couple cool down beers. I, I think and just you're kinda, right. You know, had a good time and relax for that. I but, think you pulled it off, though. Um, you know, it's it's episodes like the Chris Benoit one that we release, you know, every month on Patreon. We do Well, we do three shows like that a month. So if you enjoy what you hear today. Um, think about joining, possibly. Patreon.com slash Necronomapod. And, uh, you know, so for most of you, this might be a new episode. And for some of you, you might have already heard this, but maybe you'll listen to it again. And then. Like we said, reptilians will be back uh, next week, pending the uh, COVID doesn't kill all of us, and we'll get our shit together and uh, make it up. So again, we apologize. We couldn't get you the reptilians. We never mean to uh, false advertise, but... It happens. Yeah, stuff happened. We didn't want to give you a shitty quality uh, uh, audio with the uh, the Skype issues that we ran into. So we'll be back next week with a full episode, and hope you guys enjoyed this uh, Chris Benoit one, which was... Uh, An intense one, I think. Very entertaining. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to it. Cheers. Cheers. Bonus episode for all of the p- 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 patrons on t- 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 Turkey Day. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well done. How'd I do that, Mike? It's pretty good. That was damn good. All right. You even made it your own for Thanksgiving. See? I'm about filling that. in for you tonight. <laughs> good job. <laughs> so we've been hearing about this, I guess, almost mythical Chris Benoit episode from Mike for ages. The day's finally here. Literally since the trailer. Yeah. Are you excited, mm-hmm. Mike? Uh, my palms are sweating profusely. I have very clammy hands right now. I've managed to keep myself moderately sober to get through this. Ian, I don't know how you freaking do this every week. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was... You got any advice for me? No. I'm I'm, I'm burnt out today from this interview that's going to come out next week. <laughs> I was very it's, nervous earlier today. So, so you deserve a little break here. Yeah, I'm going to kick back. I might not even say anything this whole episode. Just sit here and listen. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> it's good because I got plenty of You deserve of it, kid. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I got a question for you guys. To kick off this uh, Benoit episode, top three favorite dead wrestlers of all time. So does that mean they died like any any wrestler that is currently deceased? Correct. Okay. So it didn't have to be like a tragic like early death. Ah, it could be, you know, Gorgeous George from sure. way back in the day. Okay. I have two. You got your list already? I have, you, I have two as well. I'm do you have your to list? Third. 
I have a couple thoughts, and I'm you know I'm not as big a wrestling fan as you guys, but it's true. I'm gonna have to think here for a minute. I, I got two easily. Yeah, I'm trying. I know to... we're gonna have the same one. One of them is gonna be the same. <laughs> but I feel like I'm missing. Like there's gonna be one that I'm gonna say, and then I think I know the one that Ian believes you guys will both have. Yeah, you should write it down and then see if you're right. <laughs> I'm going to write it down. Because right I'm now. wondering, I mean, Ian knows who I like. I was actually just going to pick somebody, but they're still alive. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Does The Undertaker count? He's a dead man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, people are going to be like, what the fuck? They're just going on wrestling tangents this whole episode. I just want to hear about murder. Um. All right. I could probably do my. my fuck. No, this is tough. Well, I'll start because okay. uh, mine will be the weakest list, all obviously. Right. I, don't, I, I don't know, man. I'm not. <laughs> Andy Kaufman. Oh, God. <laughs> Get out of here. one of the greatest things ever in professional wrestling. wrestling champion of the world. so great. <laughs> What's that movie we can reference people to? Man on the Man Moon? Man on the Moon? Yeah. Andy what? Kaufman, comedic genius. Wasn't Jerry Lawler in that movie yeah. for real? Oh, they yeah. Worked, they worked yeah. the angle in real life. It was yeah. so funny. Those Hillbilly fans were so goddamn <laughs> pissed. <laughs> the old footage of those matches with Lawler is just genius. The, what show was it on where Lawler smacked him in the face? It was like, like the a, tonight, a tonight Show, show yeah. and everyone thought it was it was real. Yeah. We're going to be using a lot of wrestling lingo tonight, mm-hmm. so I'm going to try if it comes up to throw to Ian to um, give the definition. So earlier I just said an angle. What does that mean? Storyline, like a storyline. Yeah. So when Andy Kaufman and Jerry Lawler worked an angle together, they did a storyline where they were feuding, and uh, on the Tonight Show, Jerry Lawler smacked Andy Kaufman, and it was a work, which means. It was fake. <laughs> it was fake, but they played it off, and everyone thought it was a shoot, which, which means real. Which means real. So they play. It was actually a work. It was storyline. They knew that it was going to happen, but they Andy Kaufman and and I don't even know who was doing the Tonight Show at that time. Carson and I don't even know if Carson knew that it was a work. Probably not. So, no, that was like that got some like big uh some heat behind yeah. it. Yeah. He Waller is another wrestling term. Heat meaning it got a lot of like people angry, yeah. hot. Mm-hmm pissed off um so anyways man on the moon a movie that kind of covers andy kaufman's life but gets so in that good. wrestling angle the guy was so funny a uh, little embarrassed that's in your top three though but continue. i thought i thought it was a great pick <laughs> continue <laughs> number two miss elizabeth oh yeah mm. All right. roll tide and number one piper roddy Piper, one of my favorite yeah, wrestlers i didn't even think of him i don't know if any of those three are going to be on my list unfortunately i didn't think they would be because i'm doing yeah. my three favorites all right can you do you want me to go i got mine yeah you can go Number three would be probably Owen Hart, who I think was the best of the Hart brothers. I think he was even better than Brett. Really? Yeah. And his was just tragic, sad, falling from the rafters and dying. What was his thing? The blue, the blue something? Well, he was Owen Hart, but at the time he was working a gimmick. What's a gimmick, Ian? Character. Character, where he was the blue blazer. Blue blazer, And yeah. he was supposed to um, descend from the rafters of the right. Keel yeah. Center in St. Louis, Missouri, and the cable broke and he fell to his death. Owen Hart was good. So he's my third. Number two, probably the Macho Man Randy Savage, arguably the greatest of all time. Um, frequent guest and friend of the show. <clears throat> and number one, probably my second favorite wrestler of all time, Kurt Hennig, Mr. Perfect. Yeah, we actually have two. Do we? I was going to say Mr. Perfect. He, yeah. I knew we were going to have he's him. He's one of my favorites. Um, Macho Man. Yep. But then my third. <laughs> oh, and Dave guessed it. <laughs> right? Mr. Perfect. He wrote it down. Well, I do wear a shirt every other day, yeah. a Mr. Perfect shirt. <laughs> yeah, so Mr. Perfect, Macho Man, and then my third would be uh, British Bulldog. British Bulldog. I, I don't know why, but I always have liked British Bulldog. Yeah. I could talk yeah. about wrestling all the damn day. This is great. I mean, this is what Should we, we just become a wrestling podcast? <laughs> this is what we did before the podcast, <laughs> just sit around and talk about wrestling. <laughs> People are going to tune out when you and I start debating Shawn Michaels' outfits <laughs> and which ones we liked best, as we had been known to do. <laughs> Another one of mine is uh, heck Buzz Sawyer from the old Georgia Championship Wrestling. Yeah, I don't know a I lot figured about him. But you guys wouldn't even know who that was. So I, I didn't put him Sawyer. on my list, but yeah, I just that was my favorite Georgia Championship Wrestling. Was it, you got like on TBS or something mm-hmm. like that growing up from the Omni in Atlanta? Yeah, yep. Wasn't there? Didn't we cover a story with a shooting at the Omni? Yeah, the uh, Wayne Williams. Yeah, the Atlanta child murders. But didn't we determine that was probably the mall, not the the yes. arena? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because there was like an arcade there or something. For all you patrons, Wayne Williams available in the Patreon archive, right? That it's was, available for everyone in the yeah, archive. It's regular. I archive. thought that was our first Patreon show. No. 
Son of what Sam. Was our first bonus? Son of Sam. Oh. You're well, gonna do ter- uh, you're gonna do great at trivia. Yeah, I guess so. Well, for you patrons, go back and listen to the archive, Wayne Williams. Um, all right, before we get into this, I have a story that I promised some people on the Discord I would tell. There was a uh, by the way, if you're a patron and not on the Discord, you should check it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you don't have the link, hit us up and we'll send you the link to that Discord. So they were getting into it about competition and um, how people get a bit angry with competition, and I am one of those who is angry all the time and (laughs) i get overly competitive which is why now i try not to play games or if i do i try to be very mellow and relaxed throughout them but in college i was a pretty adamant diehard beer pong player like used to play every night that's how i drank i was playing beer pong i was good i was real competitive at it but i noticed my anger started to get worse and worse with playing it um finally one day i think it was my sophomore year of college so i was still early on i was playing we had just started a game it was me and my partner, my buddy versus another two guys who we were friends with. And we played the rule that if you bounce, you can swat. Yeah. So first throw of the game, the other team throws the ball in the air, but at the same time, the partner bounces it. So they got two balls coming at us at once. And I'm not used to taking balls to the face. So as the ball was bounced, I go to swat it and I'm acting quick. I swat all 10 of our cups off the table. <laughs> not all of them. They were all full of beer. All full. The game had just started. Yeah. Is that an automatic loss? Oh, yeah. I'll call cups were down. <laughs> not only did I knock them off the table and cost our team the win, my partner had his cell phone and cigarettes sitting at the end of the table, and I doused them in beer. He just turns and like looks at me with his hands on his hips. Like, motherfucker, what did you just do? I didn't say a word. I turned around, and I put my fist through the wall <laughs> of that guy's house. <laughs> So you, so you ruined his cigarettes, his cell phone, and then punched a hole in his wall, and and put an L in his uh, in his record. Damn! In in like a matter of like th- uh, thirty seconds, this all happened. Mm. Put a hole in his wall, and I said to myself, "Self, you are done playing beer pong <laughs> as in full time competition." I, at that point on, I would only play as like a guest role or sparingly, because my anger couldn't take it. I also had a forty day suspension from our rec center because I cussed out an official during an intramural <laughs> floor hockey game. <laughs> But that's neither here nor there. I was <laughs> escorted out of the rec center by like this. I was a senior, this little freshman girl who had to escort me out because uh, I was so angry. Trouble right in my mouth. I don't do well with competition. Mm. I get very angry. That's a so, good story. That's that was the end of my beer pong days. Did you spackle the wall? I did not. I don't think we ever fixed it. <laughs> that house has since been demolished. Yeah. It was uh, <laughs> it was no good. The front porch was falling off that house. I was going to say maybe they had like a plaque on the wall now with an arrow pointing to your hole. And it was like Mike's fist. Yeah. But <laughs> it's been in here and 15 other women <laughs> college wide. The fist. Was that your college nickname? Pussy whisper. <laughs> it was for one. For after that, it was because <laughs> the, the fist because they would have parties and girls would be over and they'd be like, I recognize that imprint. That's still in me. God, oh man! God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. I've already spoken way too much. Well, all right. Yeah. Well, so before, that, that's my story. That is uh, quite a tale, sir. All right. So before we get started tonight, a special Patreon birthday wish to uh, the girl with the perfect spokes. You know who you are. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mike. Let's get to Chris Benoit. Oh boy! All right, you guys ready to take it down a notch now? Because literally the fun's over. It, it gets just all downhill from here. That's it, huh? Yeah. Chris Benoit was born May 21st, 1967 in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, to his parents, Michael and Margaret. At an early age, the family moved to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, home of the greatest hockey team in the world, the Edmonton Oilers, uh, which is where Chris would grow up and eventually fall in love with professional wrestling. Like most of us, at a young age, uh, 12 years old, he attended a local wrestling event and was immediately drawn to two wrestlers. One was the Dynamite Kid, who Benoit would go on to pretty much emulate his entire career after, and the other was Bret Hart, who's pretty commonly known as Bret the Hitman Hart, WWF champion, and um, anybody who probably watched wrestling growing up was aware of who Bret Hart was. Um, Benoit was really, uh, really um, astonished by these guys and what he saw at pro wrestling, um, and 
immediately decided that's what he wanted to do, um, you know, when he grew up. So at 13 years old, he began a serious regimen of lifting weights and working out and was pretty steadfast. And that's what he wanted to do. And anybody who knew Chris throughout his career would uh, would say he was a pretty determined and intense individual. Mm. Did you guys want to be wrestlers when you were kids? I did very much so. Yeah. I figured so. Of course. Yeah. I was pretty dead set on that for a long time. Did you wrestle like real wrestling in school? No. I did not. Uh, I did for one year in grade school. It was horrible. I, I wish it. I would have for the conditioning and like yeah. just the discipline part. But no, um, I had some friends that did it in middle school. And the first day of practice, the one kid got kicked off the team because he powerbombed the other guy. In the <laughs> They're like, no, this isn't fucking fake wrestling here, bro. That reminds me of uh, the South the, Park the episode. South <laughs> if you have not seen the South Park episode, I wish I knew the name of that episode. That's a great the episode. The one on pro wrestling. It, it, I laugh so hard, I, I almost pissed myself. <laughs> it is so funny. Yeah, I probably would have been one of those kids at the time if they tried if I was tried to sign if someone signed me up for real wrestling and told me, you know, oh yeah, we signed you up for wrestling, I probably would have done some dumb shit and got myself fucking kicked DDT'd out. some kid and <laughs> go leaving in handcuffs. <laughs> so at the age of eighteen, uh Chris moved to Calgary and began his formal wrestling training at uh with the Hart family at their infamous Hart family dungeon. Um the Hart Dungeon, which like we talked about with Owen Hart earlier and with Bret Hart, it was their family. They had a dungeon in the basement and a lot of pretty well-known wrestlers from the time uh, got their start in the in, in the business down there. Just a real small uh, basement with some like wrestling mats, like amateur wrestling mats. And the family would just train you and like their dad was a big time trainer. Right? Stu Hart was a big trainer. He used to um, uh, train wrestlers, but then also like any like strong men and athletes and tough guys quote tough guys in the area Stu would pride himself on bringing them into the basement and like wrestling with them and he would just fucking stretch them there's audio tape <laughs> yeah. or you can hear like the, the the heart kids used to record their dad stretching guys in the basement these are 300 pound grown men that are crying as yeah. this old guy is just stretching them and by stretching we don't mean like toe touches we mean like he's making like the top of your head touch your shoulder like he's just fucking <laughs> yeah, brutal yeah killing it sounds him. great yeah so Chris Benoit started his training there, um, and in 1985, make his professional wrestling debut. After that, he'd spend the next better part of the decade cutting his teeth in the wrestling business all throughout Canada, Japan, and in the United States for the major promotions ECW and WCW. Chris became well-known in the wrestling business as a great performer, despite not having the best promo skills, meaning you know he wasn't very charismatic on the microphone, didn't give the best interviews. Um, and the fact that he was only 5'10", 220 pounds, which compared, small, to the guy, right? compared to the guys in this room, that's fucking massive. But uh, that's pretty small for wrestling. 5'10", you know. Um, I don't know. I'm 5'10", 220 pounds. Well, so am I. You're not a, you're not, you guys are not a Chris Benoit, 220 pounds. No, no, I'm Chris not. Chris Benoit is this wall. And as you can see, I mean, you can Google pictures of him. That dude is just yeah. fucking... A brick wall but like to put it in perspective like i think the rock is six five steve austin six two hulk yeah. hogan six eight this guy you know he's almost a foot shorter than these guys but he was good real good he well he was really good he became well known for his uh technical skill in the ring putting on awesome matches um was just a good worker dependable guy um kept to himself didn't have a whole lot of drama about him backstage you know in real life because of that, in the year 2000, in WCW, which WCW was World Championship Wrestling, owned by Ted Turner, the billionaire who owns the uh, the Turner Network Television. And I think, does he still own the Braves? I don't know if he owns the Braves. Not sure. Well, and CNN, right? And CNN, yeah. So he owns WCW. They were WWF, WWE's chief competition back then. In 2000, Chris became their world champion. Um Shortly after that, he got a contract offer and jumped ship to WWE and started working for the World Wrestling Federation or entertainment, however we're going to call it moving forward. So essentially, he made it to like the top promotion because at this time, the WWE was the kind of the, the top of the, the food chain when it came to pro wrestling. Right. So 2000, he starts with them. In 2004, Chris would main event WrestleMania 20. WrestleMania is essentially WWE Super Bowl every year. It's their biggest show. It's a pay-per-view. It gets 
million plus buy rates, huge, huge uh, gate, you know, with the, the house numbers. Uh, Chris was the main event. Not only was he the main event, he won the World Heavyweight Championship. Essentially, what that means is WWE putting their stamp of approval on you. He became the figurehead for the company. He became the face of the company in many ways. The world champion's the guy that goes out and does the late night talk shows, does the media, does the press. Represents the company. Represents the company. So, um, you know, to put it in layman's terms, he became like the top of the industry in a lot of ways when he got that world title in 2004. He would wrestle for the WWE um, for the rest of his life until 2007. Oh, did he take an early retirement? Yes, he did. He didn't want to hang around anymore? <laughs> Teaser. Uh, so taking a quick lo look at Chris's personal life, um, back in 1988, he married a lady named Martina. Together, they had two kids, David and Megan. His marriage to Martina lasted until 1997 when Chris met a woman who would soon become his second wife. So here's the story with this. You guys try to bear with me as I go through this story. Okay. It's 1996. He's working for WCW. Chris is in a uh, storyline feud with Kevin Sullivan. Kevin Sullivan's another wrestler, but he also is the actual booker for WCW. Ian, what's booker? He makes the matches. Makes the matches. He's the writer for the right, storylines. Yeah. So he's he's the writer of the script and the storylines, but he's actually a wrestler you know, on TV. Right. Benoit and Sullivan are having this feud. Sullivan's real life wife, real life wife, Nancy, is also his on-screen valet. So she's his Miss Elizabeth. She's escorting him to the ring. She's his manager. Sullivan wrote a storyline where Nancy was going to cheat on him and leave him for rival Chris Benoit. Well, Sullivan was also one of those old school wrestling guys where they still wanted to protect the business and not let people know that it's fake. And in doing so, like part of that was keeping kayfabe. Keeping kayfabe means you protect the business. So, Ian, if you and I are feuding, you're not going to see us at the bar drinking together. Right. Because then that would kill the gimmick. Nowadays, that's gone. They don't care. People know it's fake, whatever. It's just a TV show. But Kevin Sullivan was old school. So he told Nancy and Chris, well, look, you guys are together on TV. Start traveling together. Go out to eat together. Go to hotels together. You know, act like you're a couple. Well, when you're traveling the road in a small car with someone, you're going out to eat with them, you're going to hotels with them. That's a pretty intimate setting. Sure enough, in 1997, in real life, Chris and Nancy start having an affair. And literally it, worked himself into a shoot. He worked himself into a shoot. <laughs> literally. That is literally what he did. He, he wrote a storyline that led to his wife leaving him for the man that he was feuding with on TV. But maybe that was his plan all along. To have it real life happen? Yeah. Why do you say so? Well, like just to get out of the marriage. Yeah, right. Maybe he was tired <laughs> of her. He's like, this is a great way to get rid of the wife. It's not bad. It's something to think about. Yeah. So in 1997, Nancy filed for divorce from Kevin Sullivan, which led to the ongoing joke that Kevin Sullivan booked his own divorce. Yeah. Because of the business that uh, booked his own divorce. I think it's genius. <laughs> if he wanted out. Sure. Yeah. Nancy Benoit was all right, though. She's a good looking gal. I don't think she so. Actually, you didn't think so? No. She got her start in wrestling by doing. Did you ever read the Bill Apter, like Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazines? Or like any I had a subscription old? when I okay. was a kid. Yeah. So they would always have those features in them where they would have like like 10 pages on like the women's apartment wrestling, like doing like the bikini stuff. Yeah. Nancy was one of those women mm. and like got noticed by someone. They're like, oh, look at this chick. She's she's good looking. So they, they hired her to be a valet. So that mm. was her start doing like kind of like that fetishy stuff. Yeah, I didn't love her. Yeah. I thought she was all right. She she's no page. She's no page. <laughs> People are going to be Googling, hopefully Googling all this shit to know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> Um, so in 1997, Chris and Nancy started uh, a full-blown relationship with each other. In 2000, they had a child together, Daniel, and shortly after that were married. They lived in Fayetteville, Georgia, until the weekend of June 22nd, 2007. Oh, did they move then? <laughs> well, we'll get into that. Do you think there was ever confusion with Benoit balls, where she's like, I, I want the Benoit <laughs> balls, and he didn't know... <laughs> He didn't. I'm not even sure I know what Benoit balls are, Dave. What are they? The, are they anal beads? Anal beads. Oh, uh, no. Right? Anal beads? That's why all those girls called me Benoit in college. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought because 
Well, never mind. We're not going down that road. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah. So you think she ever, Nancy would have been like, oh, I want those Benoit balls. Right. And he and comes over like, with his sack, drops it on her head. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the weekend. What I'm going to do here is kind of go through what we actually know about the weekend um, and then get into all the uh, the rumor and innuendo stuff after that. So the weekend of June 22nd through June 24th, 2007. On Saturday, June 23rd, 2007, Benoit was scheduled to appear at a house show in Beaumont, Texas. A house show is a non-televised wrestling event, something that they just do like in the local community, uh, like a band would do like a concert or something. Uh, So it was just a non-televised show that Saturday night. At about 3.30 p.m. on that Saturday, um, fellow wrestler and close friend of Benoit, Chavo Guerrero, received a voicemail from Chris stating he had overslept and missed his flight and would be late for that night's show. Guerrero called Benoit back and would later say that when they spoke, Benoit sounded tired and groggy and not quite his typical self. Um, Chris confirmed to Chavo everything that he'd said in his voice message about being late for that night's show. After the call, Guerrero was still concerned about Benoit's tone and demeanor, so about 12 minutes later, he called Benoit back. Uh, Benoit didn't answer, and Guerrero left a message asking him to call him back. At 3.44 p.m., Benoit called uh, Chavo Guerrero back, stating he didn't answer the call because he was on the phone with Delta Airlines changing his flight for that evening. Benoit also mentioned to Chavo then that he was having a stressful day because Nancy and Daniel were, quote, sick from food poisoning. Guerrero then replied with, all right, man, if you need to talk, I'm here for you. Benoit ended the conversation by saying, I love you, Chavo. And Chavo would later indicate uh, in interviews that they would always tell each other they loved each other. And they would always say, like, love you, man, when you're hanging up on the phone. But he said this one wasn't like a typical, like, perfunctory, I love you. He's like, Chris made it very clear and deliberate, like, Chavo, I love you. Mm. And almost like he want." Like Chris wanted Chavo to hear that and to know it. He right. said it was really odd the way he did. At the time, he didn't think much of it, but it was just very deliberate the way he said, I love you. Like a goodbye, I love like, you. Oh, yeah, essentially. Um, the WWE would later confirm that Benoit had in fact contacted them on that Saturday and informed them that his wife and kid were ill and he would not a- be able to attend the live event that night. So WWE executives rebooked his flight for the following morning, which would be that Sunday, um, so that he could attend a major pay-per-view they were having in Houston, Texas on that Sunday, the 24th. This was a pay-per-view that Benoit was scheduled to have a big-time title match on. WWE made those changes, but when they tried to reach Benoit back to confirm all of those plans, they were not able to get in touch with him. Was he the champ at this time? He was going to be fighting for the ECW title. Okay. So the ECW was a brand that we had talked about earlier yeah. that WWE had since purchased. So it was not going to be a world title. It was like kind of a secondary title. Okay. He was It was vacant, I believe, at the time, and he was going to be fighting for it. He was not holding any belts. The plans were for him to win, though, that night. Mm. They were going to base this. Um, at the time, they had three different TV shows. This was going to be like a Tuesday night, one-hour program, and Chris was going to be like the face of that show. Mm. Um we, we might get into this a little bit more later with the paranoia, but Chris actually saw that as a demotion that he was getting moved to like the third brand. And he was very paranoid about that and just thought at any minute he could lose his job. And that gets into a little bit of the paranoia that we will talk about probably later on. Because he was the WWF champ at one point. He we was talked about that, right? Mm-hmm. He was a few years earlier and he wasn't, he was still regarded as one of their top guys, yeah. but he wasn't seen as the top guy. He wasn't a world champion anymore. Yeah. He was kind of like just that guy you can put into a secondary slot and know that he's going to be like a dependable worker and, you know, kind of get the job done for you. Do they carry like extra fill in wrestlers that they have on yeah. standby for just this kind of yep. scenario? And that's okay. what they did that night. Yeah. They had uh they had another wrestler, uh, John Morrison fill in for him and actually against CM Punk was going to be who the match mm. was against. But yeah, so they, they always have extra wrestlers there that, you know, they can, I guess you'd have to, right? plus if someone gets injured, you know, yeah, backstage sure. or yeah. Other than that one, what, what the hell was that pay-per-view from way back? Um, the one where there was, uh, it was the six-man tag match where they, they were billing this mystery wrestler because Shawn Michaels had pulled out and they didn't know who they were going to have Phil. <laughs> I don't remember this. What and it, this? it ended up being Salvio Vega. And everyone was like, oh, Whoa, yeah, what the that's fuck? right. That's right. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's like a way undercard guy. So that was in 1998. <laughs> yeah. 
And it was yeah. just, it was Shawn Michaels pulled out because of a back injury. And then it ended up being Savio Vega, who all the wrestlers were in agreement with, like, we want Savio because he's a good worker. Yeah. But he was like an undercard, like, low level guy. And all the fans were like, the fuck? Yeah, because like, they were like promoting the shit out of that, like all this mystery <laughs> yeah. wrestler. It was going to be like DX versus Stone Cold Steve Austin, Cactus Jack, Terry Funk, and Owen Hart. Right. First, like Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Billy Gunn, and the Road Dog. It was going to be huge. That was a good match. match. And fucking Shawn's out. And they're like, all right, who's this mystery going to be? Savio Vega. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> all right. Great worker. I don't want to shit on Savio. Yeah, I mean, I got nothing wrong. He works there. locally here in Cleveland sometimes. Oh, really? Mm. Uh, at least once. They got him. <laughs> Any hoodles. But they all, but again, they had him there, like yeah, ready yeah, to yeah. go. And yeah. that's all. They always keep replacements. Those. That's always the story that's that sticks out in my Savio head. Savio Vega. Yeah. That's a good gig, right? You're like the replacement guy. You don't really have to do anything. Unless... Well, at least, I mean, he still works, but he just wasn't on that card. Yeah. And so they got him. But yeah, oh, shit. I mean, he probably Pay got me paid. six figures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll get booed by some fans and pulled in <laughs> my shit. Yeah. They were disappointed in me. Plus, back then, you were getting pay-per-view buy. So whatever the pay-per-view buy was, you're going to get a cut of that. Yeah. Not to go on a tangent about wrestler salaries, but they should unionize. So uh, where we left off before that tangent was as of Saturday, he had spoken with Chavo. He confirmed with WWE he wasn't going to make that night show. He was still at home in Georgia. WWE could not get back to him to confirm their, their flight changes. In the early morning hours of Sunday, June 24th, so this is the next day, five text messages, all the same, um, were sent to co-workers Chavo Guerrero and a WWE referee, Scott Armstrong, between the hours of 3.51 and 3.58 a.m., using both Chris and Nancy's phones. So these texts came from both of their phones to Chavo and Scott. Right. Um, four of the texts to both guys were the exact same. It said... Quote, my physical address is 130 Green Meadow Lane, Fayetteville, Georgia. The fifth text sent to each guy simply said, the dogs are in the enclosed pool area. Garage side door is open. And that was it. So side note, this is why Mike currently sleeps with his phone on mute. <laughs> because in real life, and we didn't get into this earlier, but like this weekend, like this whole Benoit story really fucked with me like i was a 20 21 year old kid die hard into wrestling when this happened i looked up to all these guys like they were like heroes to me this thing really fucked with me and it was terrifying also that you, these random scary ass texts in the middle of the night yeah. now Ch uh chavo guerrero would go on to say that when he got these texts he actually because this was back in 07 i don't even know if iphones if they had iphones yet but this was back when still you would send a text and it didn't always go through. And then like a week later, you would get a random text from someone and be like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. That's what Chavo thought this was when he got these texts just randomly coming through. Yeah. I don't know. This seems like enough that you would maybe ask the local police for a welfare check. Well, Chavo was concerned, and we'll get in a little bit more into that in a minute mm -hmm. with him. But he was he was concerned by it based on their earlier conversation. But at the same time, Given the moment, like you don't, you don't, your mind's not going to go to what the truth actually turned out to be. He just thought, oh, it's the middle of the night. This must just be coming through. That's kind of what he played it off as. But, but what's the point of the text in the first place? Whether it was sent, you know. Well, they traveled together. So he didn't know if it was maybe like a time when he was picking up Benoit and Benoit sent him to send him the address to pick him up. He didn't know. He didn't yeah. elaborate a lot on that. All right. Still kind of strange. It, it's very strange. Like I said, this is why after this happened to this day, I sleep with my phone on silent because I don't want a fucking weird text from either of you guys. And then I'm going to see him be like, oh, great. Well, Ian's dead because he just sent me a text with his address, even though I know exactly where he lives. What if I was dead because yeah. I needed you? Yeah. Well, what if someone needs that you? That has come up since. But I'm, t I'm you know what? I don't know. What I don't know what I to like? tell you guys. It's your lives are not worth me sleeping discomfortly every night. God damn. <laughs> what would I have done the one night when I was lost walking around the neighborhood if you wouldn't answer? If you you're, lucky, you're lucky I'm a late uh, uh, night owl and I'm always awake at that time having cool down beers. But you're right. <laughs> Who knows where you would have ended up that night? There would have been no fucking podcast. <laughs> <laughs> You'd still be walking. Yeah. Have we told that story on here? Possibly. I'm not sure. We have. Either way, Ian gets lost a lot when he's <laughs> drunk and walking around the neighborhood. Yeah. Geographically challenged. <laughs> um, so anyways, those texts went through, and that was the last known communication that Benoit had with anyone. 
He did not show up the next day, the Sunday evening, for the pay-per-view in Houston. According to the WWE, they tried to reach Benoit all day on Sunday, both at home and at Atlanta area hospitals, with no success. As of 11 o'clock Sunday evening, WWE officials did not establish any contact with Chris. So the next day, 12.30 p.m., Monday, June 25th, Monday's always WWE's big live Monday Night Raw, which airs you know on national television. So right. they went to the TV taping. It was at this time where Chavo uh, and the referee alerted WWE officials of the text they had received because now they were actually really concerned because he didn't show up for the event. So Chavo was employed by WWE at this time? Yeah, he was. Okay. That, they were supposed to travel together to Beaumont, Texas on Saturday. Okay. And that's why Benoit told him, hey, I'm not going to make it. Um, cause they would meet at the airport, pick each other up. Like they were good buds. Right. Um, well, I, cause I knew Chavo bounced around different organizations. Yeah. This time Chavo was in WWE. So he was an employee. Okay. Um, he also would later go on to say that he didn't want to say anything right away because he didn't want to get Benoit in trouble. Like there's just kind of like that bro code and wrestling. Sure. Like if Benoit like said, Hey, I'm going to be late, but you know, kayfabe that don't tell the office. And so Chavo didn't want to say anything until he was legitimately concerned. Right. And it, you know, after he missed the pay-per-view, they get to TV the next day. That's when Chavo was like, okay, we should probably tell somebody that this is happening. Um, WWE got the news of their tax at 1245 that afternoon on Monday, the 25th, they contacted the Fayetteville County Sheriff's office, uh, requesting a welfare check on the Benoit family. Fayetteville County Sheriff's Office contacted the WWE back approximately four o'clock that day and notified the WWE that they had entered the Benoit home and found three deceased bodies, an adult male, an adult female, and a male child. WWE was told that Benoit's home was now considered a major crime scene. WWE decided to cancel that Monday night's live televised event sometime right after receiving that call, um, but keeping with company policy, you know, they still had three hours of airtime that night to fill on, on TV. Right. So they, the TV program was still going to air. They just canceled the live event. The mm -hmm. crowd was told, Hey, there's no show tonight. Go home. So the WWE just filled the three hours with a tribute show to Chris Benoit, old, uh, airing old matches, highlights, and then having, um, pre-recorded interviews with wrestlers from earlier that day, kind of giving their thoughts about Chris Benoit and, you know, their condolences to the family and stuff. A three hour show. A three-hour show. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, yeah, this was uh, this was WWE now every Monday does three hours, but at the time it used to be two. This actually, incidentally, was a special three-hour show because storyline at the time, the week before, they had um, probably unfortunately timing-wise killed the Vince McMahon character, <laughs> and the so night ridiculous. of this show was supposed to be Vince McMahon's quote funeral on TV. Oh, good so. Stuff. Terrible timing. Um, mm. The show, the Monday Night Raw, started with Vince McMahon in the ring in an empty arena telling fans what happened. And that's actually how I learned. I must have not been on the internet all day that day because I didn't know he had died. And this was before I was on Twitter and I'm, I've never been on Facebook. So I didn't know that Chris Benoit had died until I sat down to watch Raw and I see his graphic pop up on the screen. Mm. It was terrifying. Like, I, I hated it. It sucked. But anyways, so they... Vince is in the ring and he's like, obviously we are canceling the storyline of my character being killed. And he, he <laughs> talked about what they knew about Benoit's family and his wife and kid being discovered dead. And, you know, my first thought, I remember when I heard this was like, was it like carbon monoxide poisoning? Like, you know, how do all three just end up dead That's like that? That's what you first think of. Right? That was the first thing I thought sure. when it happened. Um, so as the show was airing that night, um, roughly like eight o'clock to 11 o'clock Eastern time, they believe that that's when WWE started to learn the details of what the police were discovering, you know, leading, hinting towards a double murder suicide. Right. WWE began, the show finished, but the WWE began removing Chris Benoit's name and videos and clips of him from their website, from all their pages. You know, that night? They started that night. That's a little premature, I would think. Well, when they're told, I mean, I, it, I feel like they were kind of told what the scenario was. Yeah. Either way, they started that night. Mm. To this day, you will still not see Chris Benoit's name on their website or in any of their documents. If you go watch, like on the WWE Network, you'll see Chris Benoit still on. They don't edit him out of things. But if you were like to look up the the, the uh, summary for WrestleMania 20, the one he main evented and won, mm -hmm. it mentions all the other wrestlers in that event. Does not make mention of him. 
there's a disclaimer before each one that he's into. Right? And if you watch on the WWE Network, which is their subs- like their Netflix subscription service, before any Benoit episodes, there's just a disclaimer. Um, not specifically, I don't think about him. It's generic, just like a but... generic, like you know. I, I can't even remember what we it don't says. support the we do, yeah, we decisions don't support or whatever the decisions of, of, you know, of people on this show, something like that. It's generic, but you know, it's, you know what they're Chris talking about, about right? And it's, and it's only on those ones that he's heavily featured in. Yeah. Like if so it's like, a match of his specifically stuff like that. Yeah. So, and that mm. all, so it's been 12 years and he's still not referenced pretty much at all. Yeah. Um, by, by the people in the company and maybe rightfully so given what the circumstances, at least that they, we're told yeah. had happened. So that's essentially what we know about the weekend, not to cut it short, but that's like the facts that we know about what happened in Benoit's communication. The only other thing I found online and I didn't find a whole lot of it was that at six o'clock ish on that Friday evening, there was a pool guy at the house, like cleaning their Benoit pool in the backyard, mm-hmm. which incidentally is shaped like a, um, a world title. And you can find that online. If you Google the Benoit home, because <laughs> you can see their, um, like uh, real estate photos when yeah. they, they were trying to sell that house for like years afterwards. He said that when he was at the house that Friday evening, about six o'clock, Chris was in the backyard grilling and Daniel was outside playing with him. And that was that was allegedly the last person that ever saw the Benoit Daniel's family. his son. Daniel's his son. Yeah, Chris mm. was grilling, and Danielle was uh, Daniel was playing. Mm. Um, but I, I didn't see a lot to necessarily uh, um, confirm that. But that was one of sure. the reports I saw. So let's talk about what investigators found at the crime scene. When they searched the house, they found Nancy Benoit's body. She was forty three at the time in an upstairs family room with her hands and feet bound and some blood under her head. Her body was wrapped in a towel, and there was a Bible lying nearby. The bruising on Nancy's back and stomach led investigators to suspect that Chris had pressed his knee into her back while pulling on a cable or a rope around her neck, essentially strangling her to death. Um, The blood under her head indicates that there may have been a brief struggle, but there wasn't any signs of struggle around the rest of the room. Nothing was out of place or disorganized, so they don't believe there was much of a struggle at that time. That's quite a brutal way to kill someone yeah yeah i mean i mean i'm bruising so he must have been pressing into her pretty hard yeah i mean it's like, i mean you can just look at a picture of him and you know he's a very uh a strong guy you know oh, what I mean? yeah. yeah so yeah, mike mike was acting out the uh strangling motion as he was reading I, that. dude it helps me tell it better <laughs> <laughs> talk with my hands sometimes and i even had my knee out too like I was... <laughs> and some imaginary person's back <laughs> Don't get me started about my Benoit balls. <laughs> um, toxicology reports would later show that Nancy had alcohol in her system, as well as therapeutic levels of hydrocodone, which is a pain medication, Xanax and Alprazolam. Yeah, Xanax and Alprazolam. That's Xanax, I think. Well, they were they they, they clearly state two different uh, things. I think Alprazolam Xanax. It's the generic version. Yeah. Well, she had uh, they they. The reports all said there was the two different. Oh, so I don't know. So she had a little bit of both of them. Maybe a little bit of both. So anyway, she had two different uh, anxiety meds in her and then a pain medication. Her blood al- alcohol level was also at a 0.184. So that's pretty high. Is um, it? I never know what the percentage that's is. double the limit. Yeah. Oh, is it? Like yeah. 0.08 is the limit. Yeah. So oh, okay. she's more than double the legal limit. I mean, it's not our limit here. But no. well, I mean, I'm at like a 0. <laughs> 0. 0.4 right now, but whatever. A 0. 0.4. So it's from yeah, that, of course, and I'm taking it easy tonight. <laughs> so from that, it's safe to say that she was willingly drinking. You'd have you'd have to, yeah, willingly drinking and willingly medicated, but not sedated by right. anything because the pain meds were all therapeutic level. But she was. What does that mean, therapeutic? So I looked level. that up. It means a level where you would feel the fa- effects at a like doctor's prescription level. Like you would be feeling the effects, but you wouldn't be like overdosing or taking too much. So not overdosing, but if I took Percocet, wait a minute, what are we talking about here? Hydrocodone, so that's Vicodin and a double Xanax, and then was double the alcohol limit. I mean, I'm pretty fucked up at that point. I think that alone mixed with the alcohol, you're fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you call it therapeutic, but. Well, the levels of the medication in her, but you mix that with the booze. Yeah, Yeah, that, that could be more. Yeah, I think. But I don't know. Like, they don't believe she was sedated. Like are, are unconscious because right, of the struggle. Right, right. So I'm not sure what difference her levels necessarily would make. With Chris's, you can get more into a conversation about yeah. it. Okay. Her levels, though. I mean, she was 
She was under the influence for sure. It just, but I think it's just like you're still within the range of what a doctor would prescribe you. Is what therapeutic levels mean, yes. Right. But then, like what Dave said, when you mix that with 0.18 of alcohol. Well, yeah, that's going to. They they did question the 0.18 a little bit because um, they said that the decomposition of her body could affect those alcohol levels. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but they said that could have affected it in some way. Um, based on her body decomposition, it was believed that she was killed sometime late on the evening of Friday, June 22nd, which would mean when Chris was having that conversation with Chavo on the phone the day that Saturday, mm -hmm. his wife was dead in the home at that time. And if you go off what the pool guy said earlier that day, they were outside grilling, or at least he Chris didn't see and Nancy, son, but, but it, it would have based on what they said, it would have been late Friday. So Nancy was probably still alive at that time is what they would, they would have believed. So his son, Daniel, who was seven at the time, his body was found in his bedroom. His cause of death was listed as suffocation, and a Bible was also found next to his body, just like it was his mom, Nancy's. Oh, well, that makes everything okay. Of course. It's better now. Everything's better with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel had internal injuries to his throat area, but no external injuries were present. Uh, it was determined that he was he also was strangled to death but they believe his was probably done by bare hands as opposed to with a weapon or a cord given that he was a smaller kid it probably didn't yeah. take a lot of pressure so there was no outside bruising how do you have in, hmm, internal throat injuries but no external i, I guess like you don't have to grip as hard if you're strangling someone so it doesn't leave the bruising on the outside that was my Seems, guess yeah for at least for the outside, the internal, I don't know how the bruises go there unless just the struggle of like the, like the airway is mm. closing up. And yeah, it seems odd that you can cause internal damage with no external bruising. Yeah, I agree. doesn't seem to make sense to me. Yeah. I'm trying to think how that would work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. While Daniel's exact time of exact time of death is unknown, Based on the, de the decomposing of his body, they estimated it to be a few hours after his mother, which would have been the early morning hours of Saturday, the, uh, what was it, the 23rd. So again, while Chris was on the phone with Chavo telling them his wife and kid had food poisoning, his wife and kid were probably dead in the home. Right. What's real sad about this is, too, um, when police found Daniel's body, they said that his room was a shrine to his dad pictures memorabilia mm. um pictures of the two of them together like daniel worshiped his dad um so it's i mean it's it's really sad he's just he's a cute little kid i mean yeah. if you look up pictures of him just a, a cute little guy um they do believe toxicology reports showed that daniel was heavily sedated with xanax and likely unconscious when he was killed hopefully yeah. that was my thought the only saving grace in this for at least from my standpoint would be that at least Daniel was unconscious and didn't know that his dad was killing him yeah. when it happened. But it's fucking yeah. terrible. Like I, I doing the research for this, I got choked up so many times just kind of reading through like the way yeah. even Chris, everyone said Chris loved his son. Like, you know, they they there was never any issues with that or Chris having like anger issues towards Daniel. He did towards his wife. We'll get into that. But, you know, it's just it's heartbreaking. Like just I couldn't imagine that. Yeah. Um, Chris's body, he was 40 at the time, was found in the basement gym. He'd committed suicide by hanging. He had made a makeshift noose from one of the pulley cables of his gym equipment. He fastened the other end to some weights on a weight machine. And when the custom made setup was triggered, it dropped uh, essentially 240 pounds of uh, counterweight and immediately broke Benoit's neck. Ooh. They said he found, they found him with a towel wrapped around his neck and a Bible was located near his body as well. His body contained 10 times the normal level of testosterone, and we'll, we'll get into that here in the theories, as well as, again, a therapeutic amount of Xanax and hydrocodone. There was no alcohol in Chris's body, um, and it was ruled that he killed himself on Sunday the 24th, most likely shortly after sending those texts to Chavo and the referee. It's so, a tough way to go. Yeah. Uh, there, I had saw at one point, and again, it wasn't confirmed. I think it was Nancy's sister had said that when they searched his computer, they found records of him looking up the quickest and easiest way to break your neck. And one of those things had recommended a towel around his neck, which is why they, they believe that maybe he had the towel around his neck. So mm. again, and that'll go into kind of when we talk about some of these theories, maybe premeditated if, if that is indeed true. I mean, dropping 240 pounds on a cable will definitely do it. 
Wouldn't you rather just turn your car on in the garage? I would not want to break my I neck agree. like that. I would think even shooting yourself might be easier. Oh. That's not easy, though, either. From What? what was I re- turn, just turning the car on. No? No. What was I reading? I don't know. I was watching or reading something, whatever morbid fucking shit that I'm always <laughs> looking at. But that it's not no, that it's a lot like convulsions and shit happen with that. You just kind of went to sleep. No, mm. that sounds awful too. Yeah, there's not many good good ways to do it. Mm. Fuck. Too bad. Just take a shit ton of pills and go to sleep. <coughs> Although my luck, I take the wrong pills and then fucking start spazzing mm. out or something and foaming at the mouth. Yeah. Well, what, what you take it? like laxatives and you'd be <laughs> shitting yourself all over the bed. <laughs> God damn it! I just want to kill myself. I'm shitting oh, all over then the you place. You really want to kill yourself? My ass is on fire. I'm still breathing. <laughs> this sucks. Why am I so high pitched? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a statistic. I really can't remember what I was watching. It had something to do with it, but there was a statistic about people that try to commit suicide, and then um when they're unsuccessful, it was like almost unanimously that they meet, like once they were going through the process, immediately regretted it, but it was too, too far. You know, they couldn't back out. Yeah. I watched that documentary on people jumping off the golden gate bridge. The same thing. The second they jumped, they're they like, regretted oh, it. Yeah, yeah. I wish I wouldn't have done sure. that. Yeah. I think it's like, it's like really high, you know, high statistics. on that. If you, people with people that survive, I would imagine that, that makes sense. Terrifying yeah. though too. Like yeah. just the fear. So. Yeah. Um, while no suicide note was found at the scene, uh, investigators almost immediately dubbed this a double murder suicide. The Fayetteville County Sheriff's Office officially closed the case in 2008. Um, side note here, though, Chris's father, Michael Benoit, would confirm years later that they found a note in one of Chris's Bibles, which by that point had been given to his first wife, Martina. It wasn't one of the three Bibles by the bodies. It was another Bible that was in the home and given to Martina kind of as just, you know, with his belongings. Mm. And as she was rifling through it one day, she found a note that said, I'm preparing to leave this earth. They confirmed it was written by Chris, but they don't know when it was actually written. Right. So, and he had been going through some depression and stuff. Again, something we'll get into. So they don't know if it was something he had just been thinking about or if that was legitimately a suicide note, but they didn't find it till years later. So still not a normal thing that not one, a normal one thing. writes. No, I think it's safe to say Chris was not quite normal at the time sure, of this incident. Yeah. So that's all that we officially know about the Chris Benoit double murder suicide. From that, we get all kinds of theories and conspiracies and all kinds of little fun facts, most of which are not true, but some are just interesting to explore. So we can get into some of that. So obviously, when a news story like like this breaks, it's going to be pretty major headline news. Um, uh, major media outlets like MSNBC and Fox News had pretty extensive coverage on the story, interviewing friends of the Benoit family, former pro wrestlers. And naturally, the theories begin to, began to run uh, rampant as to why this actually happened. Um, it was also kind of a chance for the media to dump on the WWE, as many of the media outlets like to do. Um, the media elites don't like wrestling. They don't love wrestling very much, no. And they like to take a chance anytime there's something major to happen to get on Vince McMahon about <laughs> drugs and alcohol and steroids and misogyny. Else. And yeah, misogyny, well, especially back in this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was prime time for, well, maybe not prime time. It the, was, was past the like the attitude era when it happened, like, you know, the those bikini. old Sable videos. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, there was some outrageous shit happening back in the day. It was insane. Yeah. Like, the, how was that on TV? And I was some 13 it, years yeah. old watching this, loving every second of it. <laughs> um, so this was a little bit past that. But um, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is and this is just a little side note, like, I don't think people realize that. Like the WWE is a global brand and they tour around the world. So globally or flat earthily, like wrestlers are as big in some countries as like, like they're more well known than some athletes are right. Like, like more people might, might know who John Cena is than who Tom Brady is around the world. Yeah. John Cena, you know, he performs in other countries. Tom Brady is just an American football player. So just like, that's just an example and that might not be true, but Chris Benoit globally was a name yeah. that, you know, people knew. Right. Well, he um, wrestled in Japan and all over the he place. He wrestled in right? Japan. And then but with the WWE, they're touring Europe, they're Saudi touring Arabia, Asia. they go they're, everywhere. Right. So 
I mean, this is this is a big story, especially when it's like when it's, a, you know, his whole family's dead, not just the typical wrestler found dead in a hotel room and right. a bottle of pills next to his body. Yeah. This story was was crazy, especially because Chris was a pretty well respected guy. He was a good worker. He was reliable. He was always on time. The only thing ever, anyone ever really had to say that might be negative was that he was also really intense you know, kind of took things seriously and and had a kind of a twisted, sadistic sense of humor. He would mm. find like humor and things that other people are like, dude, that's that's pretty fucked up. I can relate to that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> anyone who listens to the show can relate to that, <laughs> yeah, especially the patrons. Well, and I, I did. I, I watched an old Larry King show that that they did about two weeks after this, and they had Cena, Hitman, and uh, Chris Jericho, and they all said, you know, if you lined up a thousand wrestlers, like we would, you know, Chris would be. The thou, you know, if we asked us who who would have done this, he would have been, you know, the thousandth guy. Like, right. this is not a guy you would ever say would have done something like this. Yeah, and those were not all WWE employees at that time. Um, you know, so they're not just like towing the company line. Sure, you know, when they're saying that. Um, you know, they Chris and Nancy had their marital difficulties. Um, but everyone kind of agreed and was on the same page that Chris was so in love and fond of his son, Daniel. So that was what made kind of when you started hearing these reports hard to believe for people, um, you know, hard to grasp. And I think that's why there's a lot of theories and conspiracies out there is because there's a lot of people who even to this day, you know, I, I kind of dub Benoit doubters. They don't believe that he did this or that he was capable of doing it. Um, and that they think his family and including him were murdered and that he was framed. So that's kind of what we're going to dive into. Stranger now things have theories. happened. And not all of these theories are from the Benoit doubter. Some of these theories are just why Chris would have done this. Some of it's the media trying to portray the WWE negatively or wrestlers in general. Right. The first one, the big one was roid rage. Was this an incident of steroid usage gone wrong and Benoit snapped and killed his family and then himself? Needles and steroids were found in the Benoit home. So that immediately led the media to uh, hypothesize that a steroid-induced rage may have caused Chris to kill to kill his family, um, especially because you know doctors always are linking steroid use to some uncontrollable anger, psychological issues, sometimes paranoia. Uh, this was the obvious easy target to be used by the media, as they had long associated the WWE with rampant steroid use dating back to the 1980s. And probably rightfully so, because there was a ton of steroid usage going on in the company. Yeah. Um, at this time, the WWE, I think, was trying to tell people they were pretty clean. I think you can look at Chris Benoit at that time and probably <laughs> figure out that that wasn't the case. Yeah. Um, uh, another one that comes to mind is Triple H, how he just, took that very drastic turn from yeah. the 90s to from around like the, this time. Yeah, probably from like 98 to 2000, that man like doubled in size. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to think that some of that's natural or any of that. Um, so to combat the rumors that it was roid rage or steroid use, the WWE quickly put out a, their own rumor that stated that Daniel Benoit, the son, had Fragile X syndrome and that the steroids were being used to treat his Ill illness. Fragile X syndrome looks like a developmental disability where you have learning disabilities, some growth difficulties, and then um, some malformations like with your head where, you know, you kind of have like a larger forehead and like a longer, thinner head. Right. Um, just like, so just a, a disability. And I guess it could be treated with steroids. WWE quickly put that out. I don't know where they got that or why all of Daniel's teachers came out and said, yeah, no, he did not have that diagnosis. They just made it up it, for so long, Dave, that up until the time I did this research, I actually thought Daniel did have fragile X. Wow. I didn't know that that was just a WWE thing that they, they put sold out there. it then. Huh? It, I didn't know any better. Yeah. I had always Shit. thought he actually had it. If you look at pictures of Daniel, you could maybe see he was undersized, um, did kind of have that enlarged forehead, but nothing too too noticeable. Mm. But everyone came out and said, no, that there, there is actually no formal diagnoses with that uh, that, that, that Daniel had. Um, like we mentioned earlier, Benoit's body was found with 10 times the normal level of testosterone in it. However, there were no other forms of steroids in Benoit's system, including GHB, which is what many people have sus suspected he had been taking around this time. What's um, that, human growth hormone? So, so, yeah, That's something the, like that, yeah. yeah. It's not HGH. It's not human growth hormone. It's similar. Kind of other, yeah. I don't, I'm not the, uh, I don't know I the think steroids. HGH wouldn't give you the... Uh... The roid rage. Mm. HGH is like the, the Lance Armstrong drug. Okay. So the GHB might give you more of the roid rage yeah. that maybe in the testosterone. So 
It's believed by some that Benoit was being prescribed the testosterone as a form of testosterone replacement therapy, which is a common medical practice for people who have used steroids in the past. So they found just straight up testosterone? In straight his... up testosterone in his system, but 10 times the, the normal yeah. amount. Yeah. Well, I don't mm. know if that would give you roid rage. I mean, roid rage is usually it's associated with anabolic steroids, not right. just straight up testosterone. So testosterone because steroids does you know like makes your nuts shrink and all that kind of stuff well and that's why so you yeah. have to replace it later on when you're done with the roid that's cycling. exactly what that this replacement therapy would would have been okay. for yeah because he did have a history of steroid and drug and alcohol abuse so they think maybe he was getting prescribed that um but again 10 times the legal limit yeah. so you know is he also he's getting it prescribed for that but is he taking more of it yeah. you know and we'll get into his doctor here <clears throat> in just a second yeah, because the antibiotic steroids, those will wreck your endocrine system and your liver. Mm. So it's yeah. not good for you. No, it's not. No. <laughs> so that you know, that sparks the debate of with the testosterone. Did that have something to do with you know with him uh, uh, lashing out? Um, to further support the claim of possible roid rage, there had been several alleged domestic issues between Chris and Nancy all throughout their marriage. And actually, in 2003, Nancy had filed for divorce from Chris, but withdrew the paperwork later that same year. In an article that I uh, found from Maxim magazine, so take it for what it's worth from Maxim, from 2007, and that was the only place I found this, an anonymous friend of Nancy's claims to have spoken with her on June 21st, 2007. This would have been the day before she was killed. And well, that's very coincidental. Yeah. Per this anonymous friend and uh, the story in Maxim, the friend Nancy told this friend, I'm scared to death. Quote, I'm scared to death. If anything happens to me, look at Chris. Um, this conversation was never officially uh, confirmed to have occurred. I just thought it was kind of interesting. So, mm. you know, I never found that anywhere than that one article, though. On June 22nd, which is the day that Nancy is believed to have been killed, Chris had an appointment with his personal physician, Dr. Phil Aston. Dr. Aston would later tell the media that he had, in fact, prescribed testosterone for Benoit in the past. However, Dr. Aston would not say what, if any, medications he had prescribed to Benoit on the day of his visit on the 22nd. Side note on this Dr. Aston, in January of 2009, he pled guilty to a 175-count federal indictment um, to... Um, prescribing uh, medications illegally to his his patients, um, one of which resulted in the overdose of a female patient back in 2007. Uh, he obviously was sentenced to prison, um, but none of the federal counts had any uh, anything to do with anything prescriptions he made to Chris. Mm. So he was a shady doctor. So for sure, it could lead you to believe that he was potentially giving Chris something on the side. I mean, I don't think that would be unreasonable to. They also believe think a professional wrestler was coming in there and be like, hey, doc, I need uh, some extra stuff here. I think you could make that jump. Yeah. And you can look in if you look up Chris Benoit steroids there. They're the allegedly he had been investigated from like years in the past from getting overseas shipments of stuff. It wasn't anything that I felt was relevant to this because none of that was in his system when yeah. he was found. Um, I did see an article that said that. Investigators believe he probably had an injection of testosterone that day, given as high as his count was. So it's likely he could have got it from Aston. But again, 10 times the normal limit. That's that's quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, the doctor's not going to give him anabolic steroids, but right. you could assume that he's probably maybe given him testosterone on the side or pain pills or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Can roid rage occur after the fact, like years later? Or as a result of something else? So from what I looked into, and, and actually that kind of gets us into the next part here, investigators actually ruled out roid rage as a factor. That does not mean people still don't stand by that theory. They ruled it out because they thought that there showed signs of deliberation in the planning and the execution of these murders. For example, binding their bodies, covering the bodies, the Bibles, the length of time between the murders. Um, they felt that an act of roid rage kind of is outbursts short outbursts and okay. that it's not going to last the course of like a whole weekend um like if you got pissed off and not even thinking like hit somebody right or even if he did get pissed off and killed nancy he wouldn't necessarily go kill his kid and then himself right now you can say he did it because he was scared 
and just wanted to kill everybody. And that didn't want to leave his son alone. Right. Didn't want to in the world. Knew he was going to go to jail. Sure. sure. Yeah. I mean, there's something to that, I guess. But when you look at the thing as a whole, it doesn't add up to roid rage. I also saw a lot of articles that said roid rage is not actually a proven science. And there's a lot of evidence to dispute that roid rage actually even exists. So it's kind of like a myth. It, it, I mean, it's back and forth. I don't know if the science community even is for sure on it yet. Mm. They said in some cases they think it's just the person thinking they're going to get roid rage. So they act out mm. with roid rage. Really? Um, yeah. They said it's like a mental thing where it's like you're not actually getting angry. You're working yourself up to be because you expect to be. Maybe just a fucking asshole. You could just be an asshole. Well, if you've Quite seen the possibly. kind of people that take steroids. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> usually mostly fucking assholes. <laughs> So that was kind of it with the Reuters. Investigators rule it out. He didn't have anything in his system other than the testosterone. So it's just a matter of, you know, do you think he lashed out and hurt Nancy and then decided to finish off his son and himself days later? Or it seems a little too. There seems to be like a de- like from just what we know, a decent amount of. I would th- say premeditation to how everything p- played out. If you believe, especially that rumor too, that he had looked up the quickest and easiest way to break your neck, right? You know, unless he did that after the fact, but I, we don't. Have yeah, is of- the search dated? You know, yeah, and we don't even know for sure if that was a thing. The next leading theory is uh, CTE. Um, CTE, which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a prevalent diagnosis in the sports world, most commonly nowadays associated with football. You hear a lot about, you know, these these football players having CTE. I mean, essentially, it's brain damage. Um, Well, and confirmed by autopsy reports. Confirmed by autopsy. Junior Seau and other people, right? Yeah, they're donating their brains to science, and they're finding this these these brains are deteriorating because of it. It all stems back to typically undiagnosed and untreated concussions. And I think a lot in the sports world now, now that they're aware of what they're doing, um, you know, they're making efforts to try to stop that, whether it be like illegal hits to the head or WWE changing their policies on the way they do things if they think someone has a concussion. But, um, you know, CT essentially brain damage associated with football. Um, most commonly associated with football. It's undiagnosed, untreated concussions. Symptoms typically include depression, cognitive impairment, dementia, Parkinsonism, and erratic behavior. It's believed throughout his, you know, 20 some year career that, um, Benoit had several untreated concussions, uh, which obviously would take a toll on his brain and his, his mental health. Um, Chris, uh, Chris's finishing move, one of his finishing moves was a diving headbutt off the top rope. So essentially you're laying on your back. He jumps off the top rope and he's landing forehead first right on your shoulder. So that's forehead to shoulder bone that he's doing almost every night. Yeah. That I mean, kind of, doing that, that one time is not good for your right. head. That could essentially be a concussion every time he's doing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was also known for taking unprotected chair shots to the head. So when these guys hit each other with chairs, a lot of times they're putting their hands up to block the blows. He would just take it straight to the face or or to the head or to even worse. He would take a lot of times to the back of the head, which now they know is the most dangerous place to take a blow to the head. And if if I'm correct in what I was looking at leading up to this, he was one of the few guys at the time, like not a lot of guys would actually agree to take a shot to the back of the head. Yeah. He he, was one of the few that would do that. He would do it. Yeah. Why would someone agree to that? I don't know if that was his preferred method of where he got hit. I don't know. I mean, by that point and late in his career, who knows if he was even thinking clearly, really, when he's taking these chairs. Because I mean, those are brutal shots. Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's, I don't know. And, uh, you know, those chairs, even if they're gimmicked, which I'm not even sure they always are, they're still metal chairs that people are sitting on. Like they take them from the, the ringside crew mm-hmm. sitting around. So there's, you know, 200 pound guys sitting on these chairs every night and these chairs are not collapsing. Right. So they're not necessarily fake gimmick chairs. And you're taking that to the head unprotected, not even getting a hand up to block it a little bit. Yeah. I don't know what the purpose would be to, to, uh, to just like specifically agree to that. Unless you just thought, for instance, like, um, like Mick Foley, that it looked better for the crowd. Cause there's some stuff yeah. he would agree to like the specifically that one with the rock. It right. got a little out of it got out of control oh, at the got end. Way out of control. But he took some of those shots and was like, "It's fine with me because it looks better for the show." Mm, right. And he had his hands handcuffed behind his back. Yeah. When that yeah. happened, but that was that was also eight years prior to this. Right. You know, that was in '99 when he did that, and he took I think like twelve or thirteen. Those, that was a horrible match. Unprotected chair shots to the head. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, not great. And you know, I, I Mick Foley's brain probably not going to look great when they if they ever test that. Yeah, I I saw something where he if if it was real that he that he um donated his brain Mick already Fred, Mick Foley did, yeah, yeah. yeah it'll be interesting to see what's with that yeah WD probably won't love that I know I remember <laughs> so. that years ago he had like tweeted out that his doctors told him he shouldn't be looking at computers anymore yeah, that's crazy because like the, it was just the screen was not good for his Jeez. for his brain so he switched to like just tweeting from like his phone or something I don't know um god damn pal that's some brain <laughs> god we're about to talk about Chris's brain here so um, after this incident, this this was all the murders happened in June of 07 in September of 2007 with permission from Chris's father, the Sports Legacy Institute, who was kind of the institute and program that was leading this CTE study. Um, they were allowed to um, study Chris's brain. Chris's dad gave him permission and uh, gather data and do research. They tested Chris's brain and concluded that he did in fact suffer from clinical symptoms associated with CTE. They essentially said that Chris's brain had damage similar to that seen in elderly people with Alzheimer's or dementia. So his brain showed the same deterioration as that. At and, 40. At 40. So I guess if you thought about I don't know, an old guy with dementia killing his family, would you be as shocked? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Okay. Yeah. The, and, and the Institute said that this could have absolutely played a role in his actions of that weekend. And that's kind of like Junior Seau from the, uh, from the Chargers, the yeah. NFL team. He, was that his girlfriend that he killed? And then how, what happened with I him? I thought he exactly? just killed himself. Seau. Did he just kill himself? Isn't it that player, was it Aaron Hernandez? Well, he's the one, yeah, he was involved in, like, gang He was doing stuff. all kinds of shit, Aaron Hernandez. Who the hell yeah, that himself? dude was something else. Because you're right, someone did kill somebody. Junior Seau, I thought he... He killed his girlfriend? I think, let's Google Better it. Better Google break. I thought Seau put a shotgun to himself. Yeah. yeah. He did do that. I don't remember him chest, killing... Right? Unless I'm not remembering it right, I don't remember him killing his girlfriend. I don't remember that either for being him. Trusty Wikipedia, let's see what I have to say. <laughs> What's with us, my whole... All my notes are from, so. <laughs> when in doubt. Cut and paste, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> That's not true. I use like 15 sites. <laughs> oh, no, he did just kill himself. All right. How dare you shame his name? Well, I just corrected his name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah. No, yeah, he just, he just killed himself, but they attributed it to uh, CTE. Yeah. Because I guess a lot of uh, erratic behavior leading up to it. Kind Which of like this, somebody sense. with like dementia, yeah, the right. way he's acting. And that kind of coincides with what uh, Benoit was having here. To further support that argument of the CTE, there are reports, again, not completely confirmed, um, but that throughout the last few months of his life, Chris became uh, extremely depressed, which he had documented in his diary. Um, he had lost a few good close friends, too. Uh, Eddie Guerrero, another professional wrestler, had died that November I guess it was late 05, so that right. was about a year and a half before this, but they were like best friends, and he passed away. And then in the wrestling, you know, the wrestling world loses a wrestler, I like, feel like, every six months. So Chris is seeing this and that on top of drugs and alcohol that he had been abusing, on top of whatever brain issues he might have had going on, he was getting pretty depressed. I, I mean, I feel like when you um, when you get the study back on someone's brain, a 40-year-old's brain, and it looks like someone with Alzheimer's, in yeah. dementia that i mean it's you know it's pretty clear that he there's no way he was thinking correctly I, I agree regardless of whatever he did or you know if, even if he wouldn't have ended up doing this right and he obviously was not thinking clearly yeah if your brain scan says you look like someone with dementia you have the same brain scan as someone with dementia yeah you know clearly right um there are also reports uh that chris had started to become paranoid the last few months of his life uh, in recent years, this might have been probably 2015 or 2016, on an episode of Chris Jericho's podcast. Chris Jericho was another pro wrestler and a close friend of the Benoit family. Chris had Nancy Benoit's sister, Sandra Tofaloni, on. And uh, while Sandra was on the show with Chris, she stated the following. What really became noticeable was a little bit more of like a sense of unsafeness and paranoia for the family. He just would be like be constantly checking the alarm at night constantly be checking things and for himself like when we would go to the gym and do things like that he would take different ways every time different routes the way we would go in the morning is not the way we would go after dinner 
and never ever before had that been. He used to be fairly laid back about stuff like that. There was never any issue like that. So when it did start happening, I noticed immediately. It was a huge personality change. Not crazy huge where everyone else would notice, but people that were around him a lot would notice. I didn't really understand what was happening, and to be frank, I still kind of look back on it. Was that a precursor to everything that happened? So that's interesting. So, yeah, he started, you know, it would go on to say, like, he started to think he was being followed. Um, He started to think he was going to get fired any day from WWE. Like we said, him becoming, like, not the world champ anymore and being kind of quote demoted to like a third brand television show he w- he got really paranoid and like this going different ways to the gym and to the airport and coming home different ways but then she would go on to say that she actually did not think cte is an issue and i think maybe in her mind she thinks cte is kind of a cop-out um kind of doesn't put the full blame on him she yeah. thinks she thinks it's it's due to drug and alcohol abuse coupled with the fact that you know he was depressed that kind of put him over the edge my thought was her view on paranoia kind of speaks more to CTE yeah. than anything else. It seems very likely. I mean, like I said, if you got if you're 40 and you're showing signs of an elderly Alzheimer's patient, you're not yeah, thinking right. right. Exactly. I agree. There are people though that don't. They still reject. They don't necessarily reject <clears throat> that he had CTE, but they reject that he he did this. Oh, just did the murder yeah. at all? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. That's that's the CTE story, but you know. The, in, the investigation and the science was done and his brain was not looking so great. That seems pretty likely. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, it's a contributing factor based on that alone. There, yeah, it, it plays some part into it. it. Of, of course, it yeah. has to. Right. Um, so now this is maybe the weirdest and creepiest confirmed conspiracy. Uh, and this was the Wikipedia one. Um, this one's just kind of kind of wild. So we'll just I'll dive into it. There was an edit made on Chris Benoit's Wikipedia page at 12.01 a.m. Eastern Time, the mor- morning of Monday, June 25th. So this is 16 hours prior to police discovering his body. This is just a few hours after that Sunday night pay-per-view ended that he no-showed. Okay. 16 hours before police entered the home. Chris Benoit's Wikipedia page was edited to read... Chris Benoit was replaced by Johnny Nitro for the ECW championship match at Vengeance as Benoit was not there due to personal issues stemming from the death of his wife, Nancy. So the bodies haven't even been found yet. And this this person is putting on his Wikipedia page that Nancy Benoit's dead. Right. That's, yeah, that's a little creepy, a little weird. What made this even more suspicious is that the IP address was traced back to a home in Stamford, Connecticut. Ian, what company is headquartered out of Stanford, Connecticut? WWE headquarters. God damn. Well, that's weird. That's really weird. It's a little strange. Police uh, looked into it and seized computer equipment from a 19-year-old man who was, like all wrestling fans, living with his parents. <laughs> <laughs> of course he was. Doesn't do us any favors. Um he was responsible for the postings, and he immediately, as soon as he was contacted by the police, he was very, uh, um, he he complied with everything and with their investigations. Police called this a major hindrance to their criminal investigation they were running on the Benoit family and the murders. Um, after looking into the man, they determined that he was not involved, nor did he have any actual knowledge of the incident in the Benoit home, and they were not going to press any charges. The man would later state that he had found several rumors online which supported his theory about the Benoit, quote, family emergency, as reported in the wrestling news. And he just on his own speculated that Nancy had died, um, calling it just a terrible coincidence. So he picked the wrong day to be a troll and go on Wikipedia and mess around. Right. Um, Neither this 19-year-old man nor anyone in his family had any... Uh, employment or immediate connection to the WWE, and it was just considered to be a, a, a coincidence. So, anyone who was out there looking, because there's 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 rumors that did WWE know about this early? Did, how, when did they find out? If they did know early, did they have any part of it? There's no evidence for any of that. Yeah. But little things like this, and the fact that this dude was based in Stanford, Connecticut, that's weird. I generally don't believe in coincidences, and this is very strange. Yeah. Like but, the Wikipedia entry, strange enough in itself, but then the guy's in Stanford too. 
But I'm just wondering too, like, yeah, that that's really weird. That adds a different layer to it. But like, yeah. I wonder what happens like nowadays, like if if that, if something were to if someone were to no show, like, what's Reddit gonna do? Like, you know, those rabbit holes people go down. Like, there's trolls out there yeah. that just post anything. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I I it seems like it was just a weird coincidence. I mean, there's no other connection they would have. Some 19 mm. year old kid, you know, that would be kind of odd that he's involved. But it's really weird and really creepy. Do you guys ever edit Wikipedia pages? No. I have before. Have you? Yeah. I have too. For Californication, I've edited some. <laughs> yeah. I have not. No. It's I always fun. laugh when I get on there. I get on there after UFC fights to look at stuff, and I'll laugh at some when people edit real quick. Was defeated by a three piece combo. <laughs> yeah. <something> like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In my favorite horror movie, Martyrs, they had the, the actresses listed incorrectly. They reversed the character, so I fixed oh, it. Edited it up. Yeah. See, we're doing good things out See? there. We're not posting about deaths like this this neck beard. <laughs> so that's it for the Wikipedia one, but it's it's a weird coincidence. Yeah. All right, let's get into the big one. This is the one that uh the Benoit doubters I think really hold on to, and that's the Kevin Sullivan theory. For those of you that are still with us now, we're a couple an hour or so into this one. <laughs> Kevin Sullivan was the wrestler who booked his own divorce. The one who Nancy Benoit divorced <laughs> to go be with Chris. Worked himself into a shoot. Worked himself into a shoot and <sighs> maybe worked the whole family into a death. <laughs> one of the damn. more widely believed <laughs> conspiracy theories and one perpetuated by Benoit doubters is that former wrestler and booker Kevin Sullivan murdered Chris and his family or hired hitmen to do it and framed the crime on Chris so he'd get the blame. Just to be clear... There is, and this is, I looked extensively. There is absolutely no eyewitnesses, physical evidence, or forensic evidence ever presented to justify Kevin Sullivan being a part of this. The theory was simply born out of the fact that Sullivan is Nancy's ex-husband and could have been seeking revenge for their affair a decade earlier. The theory was first put forth by a man named John Lee Clary, who was a small-time wrestler based out of Arkansas during the 1980s. Per Clary's own website, which the website's no longer in existence, Clary went from being a Ku Klux Klan leader to becoming a saved man who preaches the word of God. Oh, what a nice conversion. Yeah. So he's saved, Dave. That's great. He's going to be in heaven next to everyone else. Well, we, well he probably already knows because he died in 2014. Oh. Oh, so, so we, he knows where he is. <laughs> Hi, this is a Grand Wizard Cleary. He uh, would like to meet you. Oh, thanks, Jesus. So Cleary put up put this on his website and really based it around two major points that he thought were the were rationale for why Sullivan would do this. The first one was that the deaths occurred exactly ten years after Nancy divorced Kevin. There is actually no documentation that has ever been made available or that anyone has seen as to when the divorce was actually uh, official. Right. Uh, I, I'm sure you can probably look that up in public records, right? Can, Somewhere. Can, absolutely. But he provided no evidence of that. And oh, no, he didn't? No, he provided none. And no evidence is actually, like, as far as the, the mainstream and people know, they did get divorced in 1997, but there's no date that anyone actually knows of. Um. It's also kind of odd as to why Kevin Sullivan would wait and plan at the 10 year anniversary. You would think if you were going to be mad, you would do it right away. Like in a fit of rage. revenge is a dish best served cold. Was this cold though? I mean, is this is 10, 10 years? years. That's pretty that would, fucking cold. That would be pretty cold. Okay. Poor Daniel, man. That's what I think about fucking well. kid. Um, Clary also said that the 10 years was significant because of some numerology significance, but he did not elaborate. Oh, well, that's numerology's proven science, so that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I was going to go on record and say that numerology is fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah. We should do an episode about fucking stupid things like what? that, like numerology and hypnosis. Why? <laughs> go ahead. I, I don't understand. These Always with these conspiracy theories, there's always all these numbers. and The yeah. thing with this Sullivan one, though, is if you look online, there is a strong it's, internet yeah. army of people who believe that Benoit did not do this. Yeah. And there is, like I saw this one Reddit post, it had 21 different facts of why proof that it wasn't Benoit. As I was reading through, I think seven, 18 of them, I was just like, oh, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. Um, and some of those we'll talk about here in just a minute. But there, there's this strong contingent that believe Benoit did not do it. 
Yeah, I mean, when I whenever I've looked at this before, what, leading up to this, it's always this this Kevin Sullivan thing. Yeah, that's well, because if you're going to suspect that it wasn't Benoit, who else would it be? That would be sure, yeah, right, right. And this next point that you're going to talk about is one that I always see, which is absolutely silly. Right, and the other big point that Clary made was that Kevin Sullivan was a Satanist. <laughs> This is based off the fact that in the 1980s and into the 90s, Kevin Sullivan and Nancy, when she was his valet, played the role of a satanic leader as his pro wrestling gimmick. So it was a work? It was a work, Dave. Okay. Have you ever seen any of the promos that he did? I remember that stuff. It was great. Kevin Sullivan (laughs) was a great wrestler and had a great mind for the business. Like. I mean, I guess it's a compliment that he played that gimmick so well that people think he's really a Satanist. Yeah. I don't want to be attributed to like a murder, but if if I could play a gimmick so well that people think that, like that's fucking awesome. Twenty years later, right? Like, imagine how how well you performed in in, in Silence of the Lambs. If people are out there thinking Anthony Hopkins actually eats humans, right. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's kind of a compliment if people think that. I guess, yeah. Uh, Kevin Sullivan himself, because he's been asked about this theory. And he said for a long time, it really bothered him. He was on Jim Ross's podcast. It really bothered him. But now he's like, it, I just let it go. Like, they're just trolls. He's He admitted, he's like, I'm not a Satanist. I'm a, actually a Roman Catholic. And Clary, there's never, there's, Clary never actually met Sullivan or Nancy to actually know what their beliefs were. So he's basing it on secondhand information and or just their pro wrestling gimmick. Right. Uh, also, Satanists are not known to be violent people. It's, it's a self health yeah. religion. Correct. And in the Satanic Bible, it even says one of their rules: you do not ever harm children. Correct. So, kind of debunks the the Satanist theory. Uh, Clary also goes on to allude to the death of former female pro wrestler Sherry Martell seven days before the Benoit death as possibly being a clue that the Sull- that, that Sullivan was responsible. Martell, who died June 15th, 2007, was a close friend of the Benoit family and was also a former valet for Sullivan. At the time of the Benoit murders, Martell's cause of death was still unknown, and that helped fuel the rumors that perhaps the deaths were related. No reason is given as to why she would have been killed, but because her cause of death was unknown, that fueled the rumors. Right. Toxicology would later to- toxicology reports would later determine that Martel had died of an accidental drug overdose, and she actually did kind of have a connection to that Doctor Phil Aston, who we talked about uh. earlier, who was Benoit's doctor. So, so there's literally zero evidence to support this <laughs> Kevin Sullivan nonsense. If there is anyone who hears this. That it actually is a, a Kevin Sullivan theory believer that has more evidence. I would love to hear it because I looked extensively and could not find anything legitimate other than this stuff. All right. Makes sense. But I would love to hear more and know. I, I mean, anything that I've seen on like forums and people talking, it's all nonsensical. It's bullshit stuff. Yeah. yeah. And actually, one, a couple of them that they point out, we're going to talk about here in just this last little bit. Cool. So these last few notes I have here are just strange but unfounded necessarily rumors or or theories that people have thrown out, not as as like an overall answer, but as as questionable things. One is that, and and this is confirmed, there was 10 empty beer count cans found in the Benoit home. There's also probably 10 empty beer cans on our table right now. <laughs> um as well as an open bottle of wine found near Chris's body. But that's interesting to me because Chris had no alcohol in his system, or at least none at the time of the toxicology reports. Yet there was a a bottle found close to him, an open bottle of wine. This is fact. They did find this alcohol in the home, not speculation. And it's possible that the decomposition process affected the toxicology reports, but it's not entirely clear. This does, though, kind of bring up the question that, um, like Dave, you had alluded to earlier, if Benoit did have those drugs in his system, you know, the, the, the pain pills and the, the anxiety medication, and he had some booze, could that have sparked this? Could it have just been a, a drunk, yeah. you know, uh, drug induced, uh, rage incident? Well, also couldn't he, if he had those 10 beers on Friday and you know, that alcohol wouldn't be in his system anymore if he killed himself on Sunday. Right. Right. So, but you're saying that maybe the rage, like he lashed out, killed Nancy and Daniel, and then was like, oh, shit, what did I do? Kill myself? Yeah, sure. There's something to that, I think. I think mm-hmm. that's probably what happened. You or, think or he got... toxicology reports, those can't go back that far, you think? They did but say if decomposition I drink... could affect that. But if I drink 10 beers on Friday and I kill myself on Sunday, is that going to show up in a toxicology that's, report as alcohol? I, I don't think so, right? You're pissing that out and 
Aren't you? Yeah. And not to be like uh, too whatever with it, but if you hang yourself, you, you everything comes out. That too. That's yeah. that's like the old thing, like don't underneath the gallows. The old saying with that, <laughs> you don't go yeah. underneath the gallows no. because when they hang somebody, it, yeah, it's all going to come sure. out. Yeah. So that's I, true too. So that I think that would probably affect. So it's just an interesting point. You know, but Nancy clearly was having some alcohol. Those beers could have been hers, you know, whatever. But, you know, the wine bottle cro- close to Chris's body is interesting. And, you know, did Nancy just leave it there? Did he have just a couple sips? Or was it already out of his system that, you know, yeah. he drank maybe half the bottle and it was out of his system? Right. By the, but I guess his would have been the next day. Or two days. Well, they found him Monday and they, they think he died early Sunday morning. So about 36 hours later. Yeah. So would it have been out of his system? I don't know. It's just an interesting theory to think about yeah. if you don't believe the roid rage, if you don't believe the CTE. So this is one that the uh, the Kevin Sullivan theorists go with because there was no evidence of a break in or murder um, or, you know, from an outside person. The, the one of the things you'll see if you look up how uh, the Kevin Sullivan theory is that Chavo Guerrero, who is the guy that Benoit spoke to on Friday or on Saturday, um, Chavo Guerrero. Uh, allegedly told WWE Magazine in 2007 that he spoke with Chris on the phone Friday night, June 22nd, which would have been the, the you know Friday of this weekend. While talking with Chris on the phone, Chris told him there was somebody knocking at the door and he was going to go see who it was. As Chris answered the door, there was a scuffle and then his house phone line went dead. Chris could, not, could only be reached by his cell phone three hours later. Benoit doubters believe that this might explain why there was no forced entry um, and that Chris let the killers in. So a couple things with this one Chavo Guerrero has come out and said, no, that's not true Two, You can look at old WWE magazines and say, no, that's not true. You know, it's not in the magazines three. If there was forced entry, Chavo has already confirmed. He spoke to Benoit the next day on Saturday, right? And nothing was said. But this is one of the major points you'll really? see the Sullivan theorists bring up. Huh. There, and you can read the look at the old archives of WWE Magazine. I used to get the magazine at this time. There was not, not that was never. Well, said. if someone's gonna, if a hitman breaks into your house, he's gonna smoke you all right there. He's not right. gonna pace it out over three days, right? right? Yeah. And again, Chavo spoke with Chris on Saturday. Yeah. The scuffle allegedly happened Friday. Yeah, right. So would Chris have it not It throws the whole that? timeline out yeah. of whack. Yeah. Sure. Um, another one that I did not ever hear about until doing this research, and I don't even know if it's true, but that it allegedly Chris Benoit's cell phone is missing. Couldn't really find much evidence to support this, but this would help Benoit Dowder's theory that the killer texted Chavo and the referee from Chris and his wife's phone to make it seem like Chris is responsible, but that the police don't never were able uh. to recover uh Chris's phone. You couldn't find anything if that was for real or not. I no, and I only saw that like on like the Reddit. Like I just try, I dove into whatever I could find for these Sullivan theory people, right? And there's not a lot of anything except neckbeards posting on Reddit and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> neckbeards. So the last, well, thank Ian for introducing me to that term. <laughs> All right, and this is the last one before we we close the book here. This is kind of an odd one. Allegedly, a neighbor of the Benoit family, Holly Shrepfer was contacted by the Fayetteville County police and was instructed to go secure the Benoit family dogs that were allegedly running around the yard and to check on the Benoits prior to them arriving at the home for the welfare check. That seems extremely odd to me because if you're going to do a welfare check, why would you send a citizen over to do it for Very you? Very strange. Yeah. So allegedly Holly was the first one to go in the home and discover the bodies. And upon running out of the home screaming, and this would have been on that Monday when they found the bodies running out of the home screaming. She saw WWE employee Dave Taylor and his wife, Lisa, carrying a plate of de- a platter of deli food towards the house. This would have been before WWE even knew that there was murder or anything mm. that happened in the home because they were just doing the welfare check. Right. And who was going to eat this food? Well, this plays to the rumors that did WWE know something serious had already happened? What was a WWE employee doing there? Did they just think because Benoit had canceled because his family was sick? Was WWE doing their own welfare check and mm. sending someone with like just food to like say, we want to make sure you guys are OK. You know, showed pay-per-views. Mm. Here's some food. Did WWE know about this? Mm. You know, you know, did they have some inside information? Or like give them a reason to go there without 
making it suspicious like oh yeah we're gonna stop him by to give you food in case you're sick or well, something. that's the biggest because no one's no one's saying the wwe had anything to do with the deaths right. but are they saying wwe maybe tried to get a jump on the pr to yeah. send someone to go check on the family mm. ahead of time um the, the Dave Taylor and WWE both deny that they that he he was ever there or they ever sent anyone. And what I think doesn't let this story hold up is that the police never really even spoke to Holly about this this alleged incident. Um, I saw one article that said as soon as she saw this, she fled the country because she didn't want to be a part of what she knew this was going to bring. Oh boy! But there was no police follow up from allegedly the lady who found and discovered the bodies. So it doesn't hold a lot of weight. However, to further add gas to the fire that maybe WWE knew of something ahead of time, like we said, I said earlier during the tribute show, when the wrestlers were giving their personal testimonies about Benoit and kind of just kind of paying tribute to him, close friend of Benoit, William Regal, and incidentally, I just put this together now, William Regal and Dave Taylor were very close friends and at one time tag team partners. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, William Regal, when giving his testimony, refused to say anything about Chris Benoit, the person, and only chose to speak about him as the professional and made note of him doing that. And that was kind of odd because this was before, you know, they were they aware knew. that anything that, that they knew that he was dead, but they didn't know what had happened. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting as well. It's quite a tale, my friend. As my throat hurts. Ian, how the fuck do you do this every week? <laughs> <laughs> so my opinion on this is that it was something going on with the cte with all the brain damage and if there's accounts of him being delusional leading up to that that it, possibly he got some type of delusional thoughts in his head regarding his wife and and his son um and just decided to do this for whatever reason it seemed very planned out with the bibles next to mm -hmm. everybody um and this last thing about wwe with um with Dave Taylor showing up at the house, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe a little bit of that is like somewhat true. Check. Like they were trying to get ahead of what would have, whatever was going on there. They had had not not had contact with him since Saturday morning. Yeah, so I now mean, we're looking at Monday afternoon. Well, and he did mention food poisoning, right? So we're like, all right, we'll stop by with a platter of food. Yeah. Yeah, you I know, uh, just just as like a like a good gesture, yeah, like yeah, sure. you know we're gonna we're gonna check on you because we care about you, and I said that in quotes, and they do, but at the same time, like let's just PR ourselves here a little bit and get a try to get ahead of something. Mm -hmm. But then that always brings up, you know, did they have inside knowledge? Why would they do that? Yeah, that's what I I could I, I lean towards the CTE and and delusional thinking. I think it probably had a major part. Yeah, I and mean, you can't. Tell me the guy's brain was like a dementia patient and say it didn't have at least a, a partial effect somehow. I don't know. Maybe he got, maybe he killed the Nancy by mistake. Who knows? And then, you know, he's figured he's going to go to prison. He doesn't want to leave his kid alone in the world. There wasn't, the I mean, thing people that gets think, me that is there wasn't a struggle, much of a struggle. Yeah. Like he didn't beat the shit out of her and then kill her. True. He just kind of got her down and killed her. My thought was the CTE for sure, I think. Um, I'm guessing with the paranoia, you know, of being followed, whatever, he's going to be on a pay-per-view where he's not the top guy anymore. He's in a title match, but he's not the top guy. So he's feeling bad. He's feeling depressed. <clears throat> he's feeling paranoid. He's got the CTE. Nancy, I'm guessing, was maybe shit-faced on that Friday. Probably said the wrong thing. There's a history of abuse, and I think he just... Blacked out, snapped, and killed. Yeah, her. I think that happens. I'm gonna go back to Kevin. He's not a loser like you are. You know, maybe something like that. Something Who like, knows? Sure. Yeah. Or, or even maybe just told him you're fucking, you're crazy. You're not getting fired, and maybe that set him off. We don't know what like, mentally. He, sure. He, you know, irrational is uh, thoughts and behavior is or erratic is is a side effect of CTE. Yeah. So maybe that. There was also, and I only saw it one place, and I didn't want to get into it because I don't know, it bothered me too much, but whatever now that i'm i'm on the thing there was one report that they believed he woke daniel up had him take the xanax waited for him to pass out and then choked him out so maybe he did maybe he irrationally and out of his mind killed nancy right realized kind of what you said earlier mm -hmm. oh fuck i'm in trouble and i don't want daniel to fall you know go to other people yeah so irrationally thought the best thing to do is to kill him yeah sure 
if that's true that he woke him up and then waited for him to fall back asleep with it yeah that would give you the idea that it's like and that i it works only with saw the timeline that, I, I only saw that like one one spot so i didn't i don't know if that's confirmed fact maybe they were giving him xanax just to go to sleep at night in general you know it's not the best but yeah it know. doesn't seem great i wish someone would give me xanax every night to go to sleep <laughs> well, go talk to casey anthony yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Casey Anthony was uh was it Zanny the Nanny. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Um so that's Chris Benoit. I'm sorry, there's probably more questions than answers. Well, these stories it's, don't have answers. There is there is also a strong contingent, and this is what we can maybe wrap it up with, of fans that think that he should be put in the WWE Hall of Fame. So every every night before WrestleMania weekend the wwe has a big hall of fame ceremony and like they sell out an arena mm -hmm. and people dress up i've been to two of them no big deal um <laughs> well i mean stone cold steve austin one year and rick flair another year you're just you're sure. tell me you're not going to go to those those would be good ones to go to incidentally at rick flair's and this has never made any of their dvds their tapes or anything when he was listing off his favorite people to work with he mentioned chris benoit's name and the place popped really the whole arena cheered when he mentioned benoit's name obviously that was stricken from the records and never sure. saw the light of day um but the hall of fame ceremony is a big thing and they, they do it that you know and there's people that think benoit should be in it and i think fuck you yeah, How do you I, put someone like that in your Hall of Fame? I think we could confidently say that's never going to happen. No, it will not. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, it would be too, how could you justify that? Yeah, yeah. His work in the ring wise, he should be. Not when you're a person like that, though. Not going to happen. And how yeah. as a company do you justify that when you're, you know, you're a publicly traded company? Sure. Oh, we're putting a, a murderer in our Hall of Fame. So. Yeah, you can't do that. All right. Good job, Mike. Good show, yeah, buddy. Very good. Oh, my throat hurts. That was fun. Yeah, that was good. I hope everyone enjoys it. I don't know. We don't, we don't do shout outs on this, do we? No. Mm -hmm. Happy Turkey Gay. Turkey Gay. <laughs> Happy Turkey Day. He's not even <laughs> slurring Dave yet. Um, yeah, now, I'm, now that I'm done with this, I'm about to fucking drink some beers. See? I'm ready to go now. Yeah, this is a uh, triple recording today. The For inter you. The interview. For you. That'll come out next week. Yeah this and, and now people who are listening to this on thanksgiving yeah and also you know if you're not american happy thursday to you sure but here we have thanksgiving um they don't do thanksgiving in other countries well no maybe in australia when they I mean, have fall just... what do they have there dave what do they drink beer beer but what kind of beer well i've been told that no one drinks fosters <laughs> in australia so i'm not gonna do it anymore koopas beer so yeah all right well, thanks everyone for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed this show. Yeah, it was fun for me. So, and just to say real quick, because my mind has been on it this whole time, I've literally not stopped thinking about Mister Perfect spitting his gum up in the air and then smacking it <laughs> into the crowd. That's <laughs> been on my mind ever. Did you ever since. try doing that? It's fucking no. hard as shit. I do it every time I have a piece of gum, which is not very often, <laughs> but I try. You know what happens? I either spit it and it goes way too far and I'm like swinging at the air like a fucking, like a swat and a fly, or like you try to dribble it out of your mouth and it just goes Bleh, and it just falls to the ground. That's some cool shit. Try it. Anyone out there, look up Mr. Perfect smacking his gum and then try it yourself <laughs> and record it and send it to us. Can't be done. That's what I've been thinking about this whole time. So This That's whole time I've been talking been. <laughs> for eight pages, this guy's been thinking about gum spitting out. Sounds I've been out right. here pouring my heart out with this episode. <laughs> I just had to say it out loud and get it out of my head. All right. Scientology part four this Sunday. We'll see you guys then. See ya.